Well, welcome to DTLT. Today we've got an exciting episode. We're actually joined in a Google Hangout with a couple lovely ladies and one esteemed gentleman, Julia Forsyth, Nancy White, and Noise Professor, the Mr. Zach Dow, have all joined us in a Google chat to talk a little bit about the social artist. So how's it going, everyone? Great. Thanks, Timmy Boy, for hosting us. Not a problem. So you have to you have to fill me in on what exactly the social artist is, uh, and I'll I'll let you all take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so I'll jump I'll jump into that challenge because I like making a fool of myself. Um, a social artist is a person who helps create that space for people to interact and learn with each other. Um, it's about noticing the human dynamics of what happens when we think together, learn together, play together. And the idea has been articulated re most recently by Etienne Wenger in the context of communities of practice. But for me, the social artist is something, a role that happens in all sorts of contexts, not just you know communities of practice. And they certainly happen, certainly happen in networks. We notice it happening across the Change 11 constellation. I don't know. You know, what do you call all those people who are in Change 11? Yeah, it's, I don't, I'm not sure. Constellation it's, uh, sounds good. Yeah, I like it. It's, it fits with the Orion's <laughs> belt. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And Orion doesn't want to lose his pants, so uh, nope. it's, it's a significant thing. <laughs> and, and, and I've been really interested in different roles in these sort of loosely formed ecosystems of people for learning and doing and working. Um, and so I've been been playing around with that concept of social artist along with the, the idea of the person who works the transversal. So the social artist is looking to create that space between people who are, you know, really interacting. And the transversal person is about kind of connecting that wonderful, juicy, whatever that is that's happening, learning, playing, working, with some of the other things in that ecosystem. It might be the organization, the hierarchy. I'm, I'm not quite sure what else. Um, because I think if we ignore those transversal connections, we run into lots of problems. So this is not to dis pure anarchy or, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's to recognize that we live in a world where there's lots of actors and lots of forms. And there actually could be something quite positive about knitting at least little bits of them together sometimes. Does so that can you give sense? us yeah, can you give us a really good example of, of something that like that has happened recently? I mean I was reading the um the link. I'll put it in the chat. I guess. Or, uh, Timmy, does that the, do the chats get archived in some way or no? I can. Okay. Well, this was the link that um, Nancy gave us earlier about social reporters. This is the one. Has to, yeah. This this right? is a quite actually an old link that David Wilcox, who talks about the person who has the role of reporting out from what's happening in a face-to-face -face event into a wider network, be it online or offline. And that that's one form of social artistry. Um, the person who connects people. So I was at um, a big knowledge sharing thing for the Rome-based international development agencies um, three weeks ago in Rome. And there are certain people who are just noticing who's in the room and they go up and introduce them. Well, as it turns out, there was this one guy from um, Kenya who was a Maasai tribesman who was talking about two really interesting things. One is how you use um, astronomy to help move your cows around so that you can get them where there's grass that hasn't been chewed to bits and in a time of drought, which they're seeing a lot of right now, is a really important thing. But the problem that he's having is all the, the tourism that's coming into the Ngorongoro crater area is pushing the, the traditional tribesmen out. And he was having a difficulty figuring out what to do. And the fact was he wasn't connected with people who could influence the policymakers, because tourism talks money, and Maasai tribesmen doesn't talk money. Okay, so at this gathering, all of a sudden he goes like, "Well, I want, I want to do something, but I don't know who." And by the end of the day, he had an appointment with eight different people from three of the different Rome agencies who could look at things that could help him influence the needs of his tribe, um, not necessarily in direct opposition to the tourism industry, which would be a no-win thing. It's, the numbers are against him but in a way that could actually complement it. So he was connected in a way that has more meaning for when he goes back to the Ngorogoro crater region and trying to do something. So who is, the, who is the social reporter or the social artist in that scenario? The social artist in the scenario was a person who came to the little workshop he had. And, you know, we had 
like 90 different little workshops and not many people had come to Moses's workshop and so you know this guy said listen I don't want to hear any more complaints I want you connected with people who can do something with you so he says get out to pen and paper and he started writing down the names and then another woman picked up the cue and actually after the end of the session took him over to someone else's office and introduced him and, and everybody in that small group of five people actually played the role of the social artist because everybody took up the challenge to connect him with at least one significant person for, for what he needed to do. And so his experience was changed from being a quote unquote presenter telling in a storytelling session to someone who was now connected in a more dynamic way to people who could help him influence the agenda back home where he didn't have that ability to influence the agenda before. So the idea is like networking as, as artistry? Networking is one artistry. Now, the second piece of it, I think, is more the artistry stuff, because the networking stuff is really, you know, thinking logically, A, B, C. The, the other part is helping people be heard and listening to people and helping them feel, be present. I'm not quite sure how to say that. Um, there's a group of people who call it the art of hosting, and it comes out of a more facilitation standpoint. But there's certain people who just have this ability, some of it I think is innate, some of it is certainly a learned practice, to ask great questions, to probe when someone's talking, to really show that there's been listening, um, to share out. Like when somebody tweets out, I have an example today, it was Jackie Gerstein, I thought, Dada did a really beautiful job of tweeting out some very coherent thoughts onto the Twitter universe or Twitterverse or whatever we call it, <laughs> um, as well as participate in the chat, as well as participate in the whiteboard. But the way that she shared out the the things she shared out, they actually had some meaning that carried beyond the context of our somewhat creative and anarchic conversation. Because if you just tweeted out without enough shaping, it would be like, okay, what are those crazy people doing? But she was able to, to take it and, and give it some shape. And that's another form of social artistry. So that, that relates to Dave Wilcox's comment about the social reporter, is being able to help others make meaning of what's going on as well. Does that make any sense? Totally. It does? A little. <laughs> <laughs> Not very much. Well, the thing no, that... Yeah, go ahead. Well, the thing that I was going to say is that what it sort of reminds me to frame it back towards online communities and these massive open online courses, one of the things that I had experience with, um, I haven't done a lot with the Change 11 stuff, but with DS106, Jim Groom's digital storytelling course, and one of the things that he pushes for, and in some ways I think that he's probably a social artist to the course, but also what, what he pushes people to comment on people's blogs, which seems like a very simple thing. Just go in there and make a comment, but, you know, continually pushing people to make these comments, to to go into people's posts and say, you know, what you said was valuable, and here's some context for what you were saying, and suddenly this huge, vibrant discussion is happening where normally somebody expects to create a blog post and, uh, you know, people come, people don't, you never know what's going to happen, but there's that push there to have sort of this sense of community, and as that takes hold, um, it can be very powerful. Is that sort so, of what me, you're saying? <laughs> absolutely. Because blog comments are two things. They're showing listening. Mm -hmm. Because when we read something, we may think it's great, and then we go on to the next thing. Because, you know, we're busy and, and we're, we're kind of consuming here. Right. But when you stop to comment, it says, you know, I actually listened, I heard, or I, you know, in my reading, I, I got something out of that. I connected with you. The second part of it is it's then amplifying or adding on or or challenging or doing something with the actual interaction, so it's engagement. Mm -hmm. But that kind of reciprocity is obviously critical for people choosing to continue to engage with each other. Uh, you know, you look at people who begin to tweet or begin to blog and they never hear anything from anybody, even if people are loving it. Right. And they stop. Mm -hmm. um, but there's that transitional moment. For me, I'd started three blogs, but then like it was like 2002 or 2004 or something, it was a long time ago. I started another blog, and this time um, Seb Paquette uh, happened to see it and welcomed me. And he has this practice of when a new person started blogging, he posts a blog post welcoming them, welcoming them to the blogosphere. And that, what that did was, A, it connected my network and his network, but the second thing was it was a simple like, yeah, you have value out in this blog world. Join us. 
And so I started doing that, and it was amazing because net, you know, over time I built up a fairly large readership back when I blog regularly. It's plummeted. But, so when I'd introduce someone else's blog, they'd immediately get a lot of hits because people who knew me trusted me and thought, oh, that's worthwhile to go over there. So by connecting networked, you can help people have a voice when they first start, where it's hard to have a voice in the mess of Twitter and blogs and everything else. I mean, if you're not into a network, it's a kind of a blind alley. And I think it can be a, fa a very powerful push out the door, so to speak, in terms of, okay, so you get a lot of comments right as you're getting started in that network, and then that carries you to where, you know, as it tapers off and you start creating posts, and, and then you don't, you don't worry as much about whether I get a bunch of posts on it or, or a bunch of comments on it. At that point, you're sort of self-sustaining, but it's a really good uh, mm -hmm. catalyst right there at the beginning, I think, for sure. So how does how does one know if they're a good social artist if a lot of people listen or respond? I mean, what if they have really deep insights but they just yeah, in that lonely alleyway and <laughs> nobody's listening. Well, I think social artistry is also about back channel, not just front of channel. I don't think everything has to be out in the broad broadcast world. And so some social artistry is a private message to someone, an email, pick up the phone, a Skype saying, you know, wow. That drawing you did with the open ed, you know, was really sensational and it helped me feel connected to open ed in a way that I wasn't prior to seeing a visual. Um, little things, though, I did that when it, you know, you know what I'm saying. There's this, it doesn't have to be all about broadcast or all about visibility to the wider world. So for me, when I, when I see that kind of void and I don't know why someone's quiet, and that's one of the things I think is an age-old online facilitation thing is you don't know what's going on and you have to ask. You have to be more overt of saying, you know, are, are you feeling, you know, engaged in this conversation? That's the kind of stuff if you do privately, it doesn't freak somebody out initially. And then later on when they become really engaged, they can go, you know, head to head with these other people who will say anything, anytime, anywhere. But some people aren't ready to go there, nor do they want to go there. So the back channel is also a really important part. Well, and everybody has their different modalities. Like, I was glad, I mean, Zach's been quiet. I'm not going to call him out entirely, but I find him one of the, I mean, if you were going to say <laughs> social artists, like the things that, that you've written, Zach, about um, DS-106 and uh, teaching and learning in general have highly influenced a lot of my thinking. So to me, I consider you a social artist if that, in that sense of the term. Wow. Well, what, I'm, what I have been thinking this whole time is that systems... That I've been thinking about two things. One is, I'm not sure if you've read Stephen Johnson's work about the adjacent possible. So yes. that, that's one kind of the, sort of the shadow hovering possibilities of the present. But, but that, that the kinds of things that Nancy, Nancy, Nancy. was describing, yep. um, having to do with uh, it's systems that trend or, or favor or um, foster openness seem to, I mean, that seems to be a precondition for a great deal of this stuff. That is so to say, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking no, about traditional systems of education as, as in opposition to uh, systems of open education or these massive open online courses and, and what is being missed in, in the typical educational paradigm of, of silos and, um, you know, solo actors and that kind of thing. So, you know, I'm curious, um, one of the things that came up as I was at this uh, free and open source software community in, in France last week and, you know, with a bunch of coders, which was kind of mind-blowing because I don't speak that language. Um, I don't speak French, I don't speak code, but this <laughs> idea of what openness means to people really blew me away at the range of both politics behind the openness conversation and definitions of open openness. And one of the things that I wonder about is, does open always mean fully in public, or does it mean open and accessible through public and private channels? Private meaning not owned or controlled, but, you know, you and I want to have a little small talk before we go broad, or we want to have a little small talk after we go broad. Is that still open? <laughs> we're all thinking. <laughs> yeah, we're all I think thinking. so, right? I should hope so, anyway. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, for, for me, I think there's this um, kind of a challenging tension between open and 
exposing everything all the time. And I think they're two different things, but I think they're often kind of muddied. And that's why some people won't play. I think that's right. And I think that, that also brings up, um, in my mind, the idea of uh, open networks where, like Change 11, for instance, I'm not involved in that. I almost feel like it's, it's too far gone, right? And I was thinking that, and this we, we encountered this a lot in BS106, people that, that were not um, terribly active. It was, it, it, some people found it, or I guess some people in general find it difficult to, you know, it feels like a network that I'm not part of, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to find my place in that. I don't know where I, where I can insert myself in that. Where do I add value? What, what role do I play? Am I welcome? Am I not welcome? I don't know the in-jokes, because networks really quickly develop inside jokes and, and, um, uh, terms of art and nom de plume and all these kinds of things that make for a culture that can be difficult to crack into, I suppose. Sure. And maybe the role of the social artist is to realize that and bridge that gap and bring people in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I think you brought up one thing that's super common, and that is this idea that we, we this massive imposter syndrome that all of us seem to suffer at one point or another, saying. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not in that group, or I'm not the core of that community. And, you know, I was involved with a gathering in Portugal like six or seven years ago with all these people who were interested in communities of practice, including Etienne Wenger, the guy who co-founded the name Communities of Practice. And even he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, not a part of, I'm not a core of this community. And, you know, when the entire group says, well, I'm just on the periphery, it's amazing. We, we, we actually all seem more comfortable with peripherality than with saying I belong. Yeah. Um, so that combined with the in-jokes, the kind of formation of a boundary that turns it into a more bounded group through inside language, with all those wonderful things, nom de, I love nom de plume. Um, those are things that we, the social artist needs to be aware of because they can then say, listen, you know, you are in the core. Or, Listen, come on in. We don't know what we're talking about that much anyway. We're just having fun or whatever the appropriate response is. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, is challenging me often when I'm involved with some of the edu folks that I get involved with, and DS106 would be an absolutely perfect example, is they're so freaking clever that I feel like I can't be clever enough. Yeah. And so, like, how do you make space for the non-clever? Well, and it's funny that you bring it up. Uh, one of the posts that I did back in the, gosh, it feels so long ago, uh, probably around February of this year, I did a post and a talk to DS106 specifically about the design aspect because the design aspect of the course and this idea of visual design is often a, a very huge barrier for a lot of folks uh, coming into the course. The course that's run at Mary Washington is digital storytelling and it's actually a computer science course. A lot of the people taking it are not uh, visual artists in the traditional sense like that. And so, uh, you know, I did a talk on it called We Are All Artists, and the talk was basically framed around this idea that we often accept this lie that if you don't practice at some, or, or that you, people are born creative, and that was the basic uh, thesis of the argument was that um, you're not just born creative, but you can become creative, and you can practice at it uh, if you want to, and you can be an artist if you want to be, uh, and it's often a very eye-opening experience. The um, talk itself has become sort of an assignment for a lot of the people taking DS-106 now, both Michael Branson Smith's course up at CUNY uh, and the one that Scott Lowe is running in Japan. And so I often uh, get these trackbacks from people's blogs where they're sort of discussing this idea. Um, and it's very eye-opening to me how different people uh, accept that kind of, that argument, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, Julia, how do you claim your artistic side? It's interesting because um, I hear it's the same as as everybody says about not belonging to a community or not belonging to a, a label. I've never, um, I, I never feel that way. I, I never feel like I oh I was part of I'm part of DS 106 or I'm part of Change 11, and yet I seem to find myself in in the middle of the fray, anyway. And I never and the artistry thing too. I mean, just because I love art, does that make me an artist? I don't know. I found Timmy Timmy's post very liberating. Um, I had not. I had kind of lost touch with my artistic side until DS one hundred and six. I sort of tapped back into it, even though I have like a long, 
you know, high school, like elementary school, <laughs> arts and crafts, I love doing that stuff, but I never would call myself an artist by any means. I, I'm a biology major. <laughs> I took science, right? <laughs> Botany! Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm into ecology, and, and that's, that was my, my, you know, my academic background, so I never considered art school. I mean, who can make a living doing that? <laughs> so I, I have to tell you a little story. So, you know, Julian knows, I don't know if the, the rest of you know, that I've really gotten into graphic facilitation and have taken my doodling now to be a, a, an essential part of all my various and diverse practices. And so I've been running these short one and two day workshops on graphic facilitation for people. And I was at a, a research institute in South Africa. And we were doing the exercise you know, of using your whole body of drawing on the wall, which is one amazing way to liberate your your ability to create beauty. And then, so you know, we've got these researchers around the room and you know, everybody's doing the exercise and they're kind of, okay, I can use my arm as a compass and I can, you know, do this stuff. And then we brought out the chalk. So, you know, we were using pastel chalks. And I made a swoop of color around one of the circles and then smudged it with my hand. And there was this, oh, a collective in the room and my host said that's the first time I've ever heard researchers all go together <laughs> and then they went on to use color to make these extraordinary images which you know everybody went like I can make something beautiful I didn't even have to think about it I just did it and that there's beauty that we can bring to the world even if we're biologists or computer coders um, Visual beauty, as well as all other kinds of beauty, change the conversation in the room. It's just like when you show a picture, it, it's more negotiable than a set of text. So it kind of invites conversation. So I think we can use visuals as part of the social artistry, and which you know is the point I wanted to come by, back to when I, when I asked you, Julius, because you've been really embracing this idea of sketchnoting, of, of capturing some of the visuals of what's going on in a conversation, both to, to make sense and to capture, but when you share that out, it's different than simply seeing a tweet or words. It changes yeah. something, and I think the visual is part of, of the practice. Well, it was amazing, because I had gone to a conference, and I had done a session where Alec Kuros had come, and he had shown me that he didn't, he couldn't find the image he wanted, so he created it, and I thought, I never, never even occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> that I could actually like make my own art for my presentations and how many presentations had I done and I hadn't done it. I, I couldn't even, it, it would seem so ridiculously simple. So I went back and I had done some watercolors and I tweeted them out and a couple people said, you need to go look at Nancy, work, Nancy White's work. So I did and you have a video on how to, you, I think the big circle, something, there was, was something. It was Northern Voice. It was at Northern Voice. See, this is coming full circle for me, <laughs> literally. <laughs> So, uh, and then so I went there, and then somebody said, you should look at Rachel Smith, and so I was, I was looking at all that stuff, and I was like, oh my god, this isn't actually a thing, that pe people can do this. I've always taken notes that way. I just did, I just now was like, okay, I'm just going to full on embrace it and just go with it. I had really tried to do um, textual, you know, like you're supposed to, you know, with, along the red margin, <laughs> and, 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 and then they always, like, turned into these drawings every time. Mm -hmm. So instead, I just thought, okay, I'll just make them all visual entirely. And the iPad has really helped because I can erase really easily. So that, that's really the, the only difference is that I can erase. If I had a really great eraser, I, I think I would love paper. And if I could, like, carry all those markers around, I would love that too. <laughs> Just, uh, well, you know, at this, at this conference in France, I was being kind of mentally overwhelmed by sitting in, you know, these rows all in a row and having half-hour presentation. Half, you know, it's like, <sighs> so I started sketchnoting. And I also felt like I was like an interloper and an outsider, and and my and and I started my talk with people making people draw together, which you know I, I think freaked some people out. In fact, I think I pushed some people a little too hard, and um, so then people started noticing the sketch notes, and people started coming and taking pictures of the sketch notes, and then the organizer said, "Oh, let's scan them and put them online," and then we give and what my practice is to give the paper artifact to the person who did the talk. And that changed my relationship with people in that room. And I actually began to engage in real conversations with people. And I think if I hadn't done the sketch notes, I actually would have skipped out on the rest of the conference and wouldn't played tourist. Yeah. Well, I, t I used to so tune out. I couldn't, I couldn't focus at all until I started um, actually 
taking notes and I am completely engaged like you can't you couldn't distract me at all if, if I'm listening and writing and it's amazing that Kathy Davidson thought like Zach is the one who was at the Kathy Davidson lecture and she thought I was in the audience listening and all I was doing was in my kitchen listening on the radio yeah. and she's like wow you must go to UC Davis I was like no I wasn't there I at all I thought you were there I, I was, thought you were there I was just listening in fact if I had been there I would have been probably more distracted the act of just listening what a what an art that is so yeah, yeah. I mean it, it's and, the drawing makes me listen better actually yeah, for sure. And the first one I ever did was for Dave Cormier at uh, when he was at Guelph University, which is funny too. And and I showed it to him, and he posted it, and that Im immediate reciproc uh, say the word, <laughs> you know, connection that I made, where he then posted it, and 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 you know said, oh, this was nice of her to do this, and and I was like, nice. How nice of you to use my work. I I love it. That's great. So. Um, and then it was more motivation for me to do get better, and and I looked at uh, how other people were doing it and researched it more. So, yeah, it's been fun. Andy's saying about um, erasing and how we should keep mistakes, and mistakes are learning. Yeah, I, that's yeah. true, but it's not as pretty. <laughs> and I mean mistakes uh -huh. like I mean spelling mistakes are ugly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, see, if you do it on paper, we have what's called a boo-boo label. You simply take a white address label and you go over your spelling mistake and then you fix it. Well, that's erasing. And or you, <laughs> you show that you just misspelled. I misspelled. I once was doing a large graphic capture and I misspelled the title. Oh, yeah. It drives me crazy. I can't handle um, spelling mistakes. No, no. <laughs> I can. <laughs> I'm not a perfectionist, Julia. <laughs> I'm not either. I mean, if you see some of the the star people that I do, I'm like, kind of, uh. <laughs> but spelling has to count <laughs> in education anyway. <laughs> so I guess when, I get a free pass because I don't work in education. So when so when do we get the open online course where we can all learn how to make amazing notes like you and Julia, <laughs> Nancy? <laughs> they're they're ongoing, right? Right. Well, the there's an, an, it's not an open one, but Alpha Chimp is doing online. It's called How to Be okay. a Graphic Rock Star. Okay. But I think there should be an open one. In it. It, what? Are you part of that? I'm sorry. Are you like facilitating I did, that? Or? I did the first one, but I'm not going to do the intermediate one because okay. I'm cheap. Okay. You mean I'm you cheap. took it? You took it or you I took the facilitated one, yeah. it? I mean, you should be facilitating no, it. No, I took it. Okay. Sorry. No, no. Um, I think we should do a, a massively open one. And, and so, you know, Tim, if you really want that, when do you want to start? <laughs> You turned it right back at me, didn't you? <laughs> I like that. That's good. We'll see. How about that? I think it's really Start doable. today. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, so how, would I'll, Alpha, I'll, how would Alpha Chimp feel I'll, about that? I mean, it's a special... I think they would totally think it's fine because the, really there's this... What they're looking at is for people who want to become graphic recorders and graphic facilitators, which is... Um, there's other things. I mean, I think there's this usefulness of the visual across so many domains that doesn't have to be professionalized. Okay. No, a graphic facilitator is much different than a graphic recorder and I've tried both Absolutely. because I, I, uh, I run instructional skills workshops and we often do, we do three forms of feedback and one of the ways uh, when they're giving oral feedback the facilitator will take will take notes and I've and I use a visual method but I, they are not remotely as good as what I can do when I'm just listening because you have to be on the fly, you have to interpret and you have to sort of I hear what you're saying and then draw it, that's very difficult, <laughs> very difficult. So I have a huge respect for graphic facilitators versus just rac graphic recording. Totally a different thing in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. I'm going to put a URL in here for some resources, but for some reason the page isn't loading and it's kind of worrying me. Uh -oh. No, it loads but for my, me. My internet connectivity sucks today, so I put it in both chat rooms. Is there okay. some beginning um, resources? And there's a Facebook group that a bunch of us have where we share ideas. If you're, if you're interested in joining, find me on Facebook or look for, I'll put, again, I'll put it in here. It's RossViz10. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, RossViz, yeah, of course. And the tag. And this is out of a group that we've been um, meeting now two years in Rosslyn, B.C., which is a gorgeous place, mm -hmm. and doing two-and-a-half-day workshops. So we're going to do another one next June. And from that, um, we did a workshop with folks from the Ministry of Agriculture up in Edmonton. And, you know, you think, folks from the Ministry of Agriculture? That's pretty cool. <laughs> I hear a lot of cities use graph facilitation, like municipal uh, city gatherings. That they, um, uh, who told me that? Somebody was telling me that they've, and then there's like this, you know, an amount of paper. 
<laughs> per per minute, or <laughs> something the size of the paper that you need, wow. and then you get people to come to consensus building, and then it's literally on the wall of of, of what people's mm -hmm. ideas or values or whatever kind of workshop you're doing with the community groups. I've heard a lot of people. And it's interesting. Do that. It's interesting you think about when that's put in the hands of the graphic recorder or when that's put in the hands of everybody. So there's participatory methods. So just like you think about DS-106 as being a way that people are creatively contributing to this stream called, you know, DS radio or whatever it's called. Because I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> when you build the participation into the design, it changes the experience. And again, if people are totally freaked out about drawing, then you have to get to that comfort zone. So I use like Johnny Moore's little co-face drawing exercise, which is really wonderful. Yeah, and it great. opens up the door. You could all do it. Simple. So cool. And we went over, we went yeah. over our 15 minutes. I know. I'm anyway. sorry to me. <laughs> That's not a problem whatsoever. This is great. And as, yeah, as, as, Zach would, as Zach would remind me, the 15 minutes is an arbitrary limit that I should get rid of pronto. <laughs> <laughs> when, when it is called for. <laughs> Well, thank you well, all so much for this yeah. discussion. This is great stuff. I think, you know, um, visualization and things like this, it's just becoming more and more uh, important, I think, as we move forward in these online spaces and how do we visualize this kind of stuff. And so I'm really excited by the stuff that I've, I've heard so far. We definitely need to look at how we can get more people involved with this, I think. <laughs> So the work we need to do for Change 11 this week is to look for more digital, or uh, digital, social artists. And yeah, I'm look for an example of a social artist and tag it. I'm making a little visual right here. Um, tag it, uh, Change 11, and social artist, and tweet it out or wh however you know you want to get it in there, and look at the story. You know, I love it. <laughs> I love it. And I was, I, I haven't finished, but I just started. There, yay! <laughs> well, that's the answer to everything, by the way, is DS-106. <laughs> Every meeting I go to, how are we going to solve our budget problems? DS-106. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so should I take this to the international development world? And, you know, we're going to, we're going to solve world hunger now, right? There you go. DS-106. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Timmy, for hosting. All right, and thank you all, and thank you for watching DTLT today. Uh, this has been an episode, uh, and all of this, all these links that we mentioned and everything else will be uh, in a blog post that will show up on dtlttoday.com. So thank you all for watching. Take care. Mm -hmm.